Good morning, afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining today's training session on the basics of using TechPlot 360. This will be a great way to get started using TechPlot 360 for your own work. My name is Jared McGarry, and I'm one of the account managers at TechPlot. I started with TechPlot as part of the technical support team, so I've had some experience working with many of our customers. I will be joined by my colleague, Devin Simpson, the product owner for TechPlot, who will assist me in answering questions that come up during the demonstration. Before we begin the training, I wanna say a few words about TechPlot, the company, and TechPlot 360. TechPlot was founded in 1981 by two Boeing aeronautical engineers who originally started writing CFD codes. They realized that there was a need to visualize their results, so they hired a developer to do that for them, and that developer is still active at TechPlot to this day. That was 40 years ago, and we are still going strong with over 47,000 customers worldwide and in multiple industries and disciplines. TechPlot 360 is known as the most complete desktop post-processing solution. It has the ability to render not only beautiful 3D plots like the one shown below here, but also quantitative plots with line plotting and 2D plotting where the real decisions are often made. We are dedicated to saving you time, and we do this in several ways, by optimizing the way data processing is done in TechPlot 360, by reducing the number of mouse clicks for common workflows, and by automating TechPlot 360 through macros and Python. We're also dedicated to solving the big problems in CFD, one of which is post-processing large heterogeneous data sets. One of the most time-consuming parts of post-processing is loading data off the disk, and the image here represents our SZL, or subzone load on demand file format, which helps you by loading less data because it waits until you need to use the data to load it, uses less RAM because less data is loaded at one time, and it performs workflows faster, which saves you time in your work. TechPlot 360 is also a suite of tools, one of which is TechPlot Chorus, which allows you to analyze ensembles of data. For example, if you're doing design experiments, this tool will help you see the big picture in TechPlot Chorus and then filter down to the details as a companion to TechPlot 360, which helps get you to the answers you need faster. TechPlot 360 also has a built-in macro language and more recently a full-featured Python API, which has opened the doors for more advanced automation and post-processing analysis. All right, and now let's get into the training. So here is our agenda for today, which I expect to take uh, 40 minutes, and then I'll do my best to answer your questions, and I will be assisted by Devin, uh, the TechPlot product owner, uh, to help me field some of the questions that do come up during the demonstration. Um, before I, uh, uh, first I'll walk through what, uh, what the agenda entails. So I'll do a quick tour of the TechPlot user interface. Um, I'll then show uh, how to bring in your data using uh, one of our data loaders, then show how to explore your data using the plot sidebar and zone tools, and also the derived objects like slices, ISO services, and stream traces. Then show how to calculate new quantities within TechPlot 360 using the equation tool, and then the calculate variables uh, tool as part of the CFD analyze tool set. I'll show some data extraction over time because we'll be working with an unsteady simulation I'll then show from that extraction how to do some line plotting, and then finally show how to export uh, your, uh, your plot to an image or a video uh, uh, animation. And then finally, we'll close with some of the questions. All right, now let's get into the actual demonstration of TechPlot 360. So I'm gonna switch over to uh, TechPlot 360 and do a quick uh, tour of what the uh, tools are and what the user interface is for TechPlot 360. So at the top, we have the top uh, drop-down Menu, menus, uh, the ones we'll be using most today are the file dropdown for opening layouts and loading data, view for quick shortcuts for adjusting our view, data for taking a look at the data set we'll be working with in TechPlot 360. It's, right now it's grayed out because we don't have any data loaded. Um, and then the analyze dropdown menu is for our CFD analyze tool set, which we'll use for some of the additional variable calculation later on in the demonstration. We won't be using any of the automation tools like the macro language or uh, the Python API, but for reference, the scripting dropdown menus where you can get started if you want to uh, record a macro or a Python script to start automating some of your work. Just below the dropdown menus, we have the toolbars. You have the file toolbar for uh, quick shortcuts uh, for creating new layouts, loading data sets, uh, 
we have the view toolbar for adjusting and manipulating the plot view once we have a uh, data set in frame. We have the data toolbar for making plot style changes. And then we have the insert toolbar for adding text, images, geometries, and then for drawing new frames. Below this to the left, we have the plot sidebar, which will have all the toggles for updating our plot. Uh, for the active frame. Right now it's grayed out because we don't have any data brought in. That'll change shortly. Below this, we have the frame sidebar, which will uh, show the active frame that we're looking at, which is uh, what contains our plots and our data. And then to the right, we have the probe sidebar, which is empty for now, but this will update once we use the probe tool, which is a good uh, tool for getting more specific information at, uh, at specific points in our data set. This gray background is what we call the workspace, which is what the frames and the plots will be overlaid on. And right now on top of this is the welcome screen, which has shortcuts for uh, opening layouts and data sets, links to some of recent layouts that I've been working with, links to our documentation in the installation. And then if you have internet access, links to our online resources. And then in the bottom right, uh, contact information for our technical support team. All right, with that, let's bring in a data set. We can do this by clicking load data to bring up the file load data dialog. We could also do this from the file drop down menu if we wanted to do that, or using the file toolbar up here. So there's a couple of different options for bringing up the load data dialog uh, if we want to use that. Uh, one, one thing to point out again for the contact information for our technical support team in the bottom right, I recommend uh, this because we have a in house technical support team. Uh, we don't uh, outsource it at all. So if you do have any questions while you're using TechPaw 360, or if you um, have questions, uh, contact them and they'll help you uh, work through it rather than you having to uh, uh, spend your time having to figure it out on your own. All right, now that I've got the load data dialog brought up, I can select from this drop down here a whole list of different data loaders that can be used. The data that I'm using today is uh, going to be in our TechPlot binary uh, plot format, or PLT. Uh, if I use this all supported files data loader, we can also see uh, from, based on the file extension, which uh, data loader, or which files are available to us using the existing data loaders that we have here. And TechPlot will do its best to pick the data loader uh, that's preferred. So in this case, I'll just select this unsteady wing uh, plot file, select open, welcome screen goes away, and now we have this frame update with our data set shown uh, in, the, in the plot. So now I'll walk through how to manipulate the plot using the view toolbar shown here. So the first tool we have selected is the selector tool. I can use this to click uh, zones or the regions of data in our data set. I can select different plot elements like the axes that are already plotted here. And if I click the edge of the frame here, uh, once these anchor points appear, I can adjust uh, and resize the frame if I want to do that. Next, we have the adjuster tool, which can do similar things to the selector tool, uh, but also has a couple uh, distinctions for uh, adjusting the plot, um, which I will show once we use the XY line plot type a little bit later. Next is the magnify tool. If I click and drag, I can zoom in on my plot. And if I zoom in too far, I can control and left click to zoom back out. You can also use control F to do a quick view fit of all surfaces. And for reference, that can be found from the view drop down menu to see the shortcut for fitting all uh, active surfaces in our plot. There we go. Next, we have the translate tool for moving the, the view of the plot back and forth. And then we have these rotation tools, uh, quite a few of them. So we have standard rotation, roller ball, twist, and then these X, Y, Z axes locked rotations, which uh, Z axis rotation is great for this type of data set. And as I'm rotating this, it can look a little uh, clumsy. And that's because the center of rotation by default is at the origin of our data set. Let's say if I zoomed in a bit further and I wanted to rotate about the center of the current uh, view in the frame, I can uh, click with my mouse and then press O on my keyboard to reset the center of rotation or the origin rotation to that specific point uh, to make the rotation a little bit easier. All right, next let's take a look at what, uh, what is actually in this data set as far as TechPlot uh, 360 is concerned. So if I go to data, data set info, we bring up the data set information dialog and I can just draw to expand this a little bit. And we can see we have our zones or the regions of data or parts for our data set on the left and the variables for the zones on the right. So uh, I have 
these repeated uh, zone names, fluid volume and wing, and that's because those represent the two different uh, zones or parts per solution time for this unsteady simulation. So you can see at the bottom here, we can see the, the zone type, number of points and elements for the zone, and we also have the solution time and time strand. Uh, so the solution time uh, is going to indicate the time step we ought to be at for the zones, and then the time strand is assigned for the, uh, the zone type or the zone uh, or the part that we're wanting to look at. So the fluid volume represents time strand one, and the wing represents time strand two, and those repeat throughout uh, the zones in our data set. The next tab over is the data set tab, gives us more information about the data file that we're looking at. We'll see a list of all the data files that we're loading in, if we've loaded in multiple. In this case, uh, we just have the one. And then at the bottom, we have a breakdown of the number of zones, variables, elements, and points for our whole data set. Next tab is the aux data or auxiliary data. And this is good for a single value or property for a zone, specific zone, in this case, the wing, or for an entire uh, data set. If you wanna save um, a single value or a specific property, you'd save it as auxiliary data or aux data, and this is where you'd uh, uh, see this as available for your data set. All right, let's step through some of the uh, zone layer toggles and use the plot sidebar uh, and the right-click context menu uh, to explore our data a little bit more. So the zone layer uh, toggles shown in the plot sidebar here are global for the frame that we're looking at here. So we could toggle mesh on and off for all zones. In this case, it'll just show it for the wing surface zone that we're looking at here. We can do the same by right-clicking to bring up this right-click context menu for the wing zone that we're looking at here. And we'll see repeated the, the, the mesh, the contour, vectors, shade, edge, and then this final one is uh, the translucency uh, uh, toggle. Uh, for uh, which is uh, lower in the plot cyber under the effects uh, section. So if I right click and then left click this mesh toggle, we'll see the mesh toggle on for our plot. And what I can also do is I can click and hold the middle mouse button to zoom in to see what our mesh actually looks like. And if I right click again, I can click this little drop down and change the mesh color if I want to. I can also double click the wing zone to bring up the zone style dialog, which can also be brought up by clicking the zone style button here. And I can make uh, those same adjustments using the zone style uh, dialog. Uh, just mesh color if we want to change line thickness, uh, line pattern, etc. What we can also do, uh, or the next zone layer uh, down, is the contours. If I right click again and turn on these uh, contour, uh, we'll see uh, that up here on the wing surface, and if I turn off the mesh, the wing, we'll see that it's uh, all one color right now, and that's because for the first time step for this uh, simulation, uh, we just have zero values for our pressure. Um, so they all appear as that single uh, contrary level value. So once I step through the time animation in a moment, we'll see those actually change, uh, change for the animation. The next uh, zone layer toggles like shade, and if I turn off the, the contour, we'll see the shade here can do the global toggle on and off for this. And what this is, is just a single color for the surface. If I wanted to, I could adjust uh, the shade color. Um, for this data set, doesn't provide us too much useful information as far as the data is concerned. So what I could do is turn on the contour and just leave the shade toggled off and we don't, uh, we don't notice any difference. The next three zone layer toggles, vector, edge, and scatter. I won't go into too much uh, detail yet, especially the vector, because we don't have uh, much interesting vector information along the wing surface. Um, that's going to be contained in the fluid volume, which is the other zone that we haven't made uh, visible with any plot styles just yet. So I'll revisit vectors once we uh, use the derived objects just below um, to visualize more information in the fluid volume. All right, just below the zone style button is this time animation tool. And if I step through here, through the different time steps, we'll see the pressure change along the wing surface. We can also hit this play button to have it all play back. And if I click this gear icon, we have even more options for setting up our animation, start and end time. And then we also have this option to limit the animation speed. Let's reduce this a little bit so that when we animate through, it happens a little bit slower and we can actually see the change uh, or observe the change more easily. All right, so the contour uh, gives us some information along the 
uh, the whole wing surface, but if you want details at a specific data point, what we can use is this probe tool. So I can click the tool from the probe sidebar here or from the uh, data toolbar. And if I left click, what this will give me, we'll see my cursor changes to a crosshair and we get the point pinned and the probe sidebar updates with more detailed information about the variables at that specific point. And if I zoom in, let's toggle the mesh back on as well. So the first uh, option, if I just left click, this gives us the values at that exact point that we're probing at. But if I hold control and left click, the probe will snap to the nearest node and give us the exact information at that, uh, at that node in our data set. So you'll see the top three variables, X, Y, and Z, uh, do not have an asterisk next to them like the other variables. And that's because the asterisk indicates that the value uh, for these other variables is being interpolated from the cell center. So the X, Y, Z variables are saved at the node. Other variables are saved at the cell center. So if we want to see what the actual cell center values are, we go with this tab down, cell center values. If I left click anywhere in the cell, we'll see these values remain the same, but these are the uh, precise values uh, that, we were, that we have for our data set for pressure, X, Y, Z velocity, and then nothing for density and laminar viscosity on the wing surface. The next tab down is the zone and cell info tab. This gives us uh, information about which zone we're probing at, number of points, elements, and we also get an indication of what solution time we are at. Right now we're at the final time step showing 50. Below this we have uh, information about the element or cell we're probing at and the neighboring nodes. And the final tab is uh, uh, information about neighboring cells for face neighbor information. All right, so now that we've uh, stepped through some of the initial uh, options for exploring our data set uh, for the existing zones, let's use the derived objects to uh, see what's happening in the fluid volume zone around the wing surface. So the first derived object I wanna show is the slice tool. You can use this by clicking the slice placement tool. And wherever I click on the plot on this wing surface, we'll get a slice drawn through uh, the 3D uh, fluid volume. In this case, it's using the same contour variable of pressure uh, to give us an indication of what the pressure looks like at that location on the slice and then extend it throughout the fluid volume. I can press uh, X, Y, and Z on my keyboard to adjust the orientation to quickly change it from XYZ orientation. I can also press A to change to an arbitrary slice. And if I click and adjust here, we have this arbitrary slice tool. And if I uh, Grab it here. What this allows me to do is I can adjust the slice like I would the other slice tool. We also have this option to change the orientation as if we want to have a custom slice orientation um, rather than just a straight X, Y, Z uh, normal direction for a slice. Using the arbitrary slice tool is perfect for that. For this uh, data, I'm actually going to stick with the X uh, orientation slice initially for the first slice group. And if I want to see the other slice groups, I can click this gear icon here. We can have up to eight different slice groups. I can change the slice location, slice orientation, and then I can also adjust the precise uh, origin of my slice and enter it here if I want. And now if I step through time, we'll see the pressure change not just along the wing surface, but through the fluid volume as well. Now maybe I wanna change what the uh, color map is, and maybe adjust the contour that's being used on the wing surface and in the fluid volume. So for that, what I can do is I can go to this contour tab and from the drop down, I can select from eight different contour groups available to us. And if I wanna modify the contour group being used, I can click this gear icon to open up the contour details dialog. This can also be done by clicking the gear icon next to the contour toggle. What this allows me to do is change the contour variable if I want, reset the levels, and I can also select from this drop down to change to a different color map that's used. So let's say I want to use a diverging uh, color map because we have a uh, contour variable centered at zero, send it to positive 250 to minus 250. So using a diverging color map will be a little bit better for indicating the large changes in the pressure as we step through the animation. So we click play again here. We'll see the large pressure change uh, on top of the wing surface and in the fluid volume with a color map that's a little more suitable. All right, next what I'll show is uh, vectors and not using the vector toggle in the zone layers, but using vectors along the slice. So what I can do is just like a zone, I can right click the slice, 
toggle on um, other elements for the slice like I would a zone. If I wanted to show the mesh, I could. I can turn on and off the contour. You can also toggle on the vectors by clicking the option here. And we're prompted to provide our vector variables. If I want to select different ones, I can select the drop down here. In this case, TechBot's done a good job of picking the XYZ velocity variable variables. So I'll click OK. And now the slice will update showing vectors along uh, or through the fluid volume. And as we click play, we'll see those uh, velocity vectors change over time. Now, because of the, uh, the type of uh, mesh they're using for the fluid volume and what the slice is borrowing from, uh, we have a lot more vectors closer to the wing surface uh, just due to the precision of the mesh, um, which can be good, but it looks a little cluttered right now. So what we might want to do, if I go to this vector tab from the slice details and click vector details, which can also be opened from the gear icon next to the vector toggle here. This allows me to, first I could redefine my vector variables if I get it wrong the first time. I can redefine the vector length if I wanna size those up. And then we have this option to use even vector spacing. So if I toggle this on, what TechPlot360 will do is plot less vectors along those nodes, um, which creates a close to uniform vector distribution along the wing surface and makes for a less busy plot. If I zoom in a little bit, maybe I, want a couple more plotted so I click reset spacing. I could also adjust the approximate spacing in each XYZ direction if I do want a little more precision uh, or more vectors plotted in each direction. Now if I zoom back out, we'll hit play and it looks a little less busy near the wing surface. All right, and that's the slice tool. We'll come back to that uh, once we use one of the other derived objects. Uh, but the next derived object, we won't need to use it. That's the isosurfaces tool. And for that, what I'll do is toggle off slices for now. And before I toggle on isosurfaces, I'll open up the details dialog so I can properly define it before um, TechPlot has to draw it. Um, so what I'll do for the isosurfaces is they're defined by the existing contour groups in our data set. So rather than using pressure, let's say I want to use one of the other ones that's been predefined like the contour group three for Y velocity. And maybe I wanna know what the, uh, where the Y velocity is 20 in my data set, keep the remaining defaults. And now if I toggle on isosurfaces, we get a uh, isosurface drawn uh, where vo Y velocity is uh, 20, just above the wing surface. And if I click play, we'll see this isosurface be created for the animation, just like our other uh, derived objects. Like the slices and the zones, I can right-click isosurface if I want to see the mesh for it. Maybe I want to toggle on vectors for it for something a little different. Um, and I can uh, change to just a shade if I want to not uh, use the, the contour for that. And if I want to change to a, uh, to a different uh, isosurface color, I can do that as well. All right, the next uh, derived object I'll show is the stream traces tool. And for that, I'm going to toggle off uh, the isosurfaces, toggle back on slices, and I'm going to open up the slice details to add a additional uh, or define an additional uh, slice group to show there. Um, so for that, I'm going to turn on slice group two. And this places a slice in the Y planes direction. And this is a great, uh, spot to draw the stream traces on because we'll need a surface or a stream, uh, sorry, a surface or a zone uh, to draw our stream traces uh, C points in order to visualize them. And uh, instead of uh, just deactivating or uh, instead of having to go into the dialog to deactivate this first slice group, let me just select hide for now and we can toggle that back on if we need it later. So now that we have a slice in the Y planes direction, I can click this slice or sorry, stream trace placement tool by single click, we'll get a single stream trace. If I click and drag, we'll get a rake of stream traces. And if I open up this stream trace details dialog, we can redefine the number of stream traces that are seeded for the rake of stream traces. In this case, it's 10. We can also change the stream trace format. In this case, we've defaulted to volume line. If we wanted to draw them on a surface, we could do that as well. We could also use volume ribbons. If I click here, we get a ribbon or a uh, 2D surface in the 3D space or volume rod, which is a uh, by default three-pointed uh, more 3D object in 3D space. And uh, the rods and uh, ribbons are a little difficult to see. So if I go to the rod and ribbon tab, I can change the color to red 
so they stand out a little bit more and they're easier to see. And we can do the same thing with the lines if I change those here. So now that I've drawn the string traces, what I can do is uh, I can right click this slice that I've created here and I can toggle on translucency so I can see what the stream traces look like in front of the uh, slice as well. Maybe I want to adjust how translucent the slice is. At this point, uh, maybe uh, the, the slice is so translucent we don't necessarily need it. So I could just select hide to remove it and then toggle back on that first slice group so we can see that. All right, and those are the different derived objects we can use for our data set. And just below the derived object toggles are the effects. Toggles, I can turn on and off lighting for our data set. You can click and hold to change the light source. And then we have also the option to toggle on translucency. So I use translucency for the slices. This toggle is for the zones. And if I want to, I can adjust how translucent uh, this might be or just have it not apply to this zone at all. You'll notice the global toggle for translucency is still here if we had other zones that were using it, and we can just turn it off if we want to eliminate that altogether. All right, so that is a quick tour of how to uh, explore your data set using the plot sidebar, using the zone layers and the derived object tools. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is actually, let's toggle off the vectors for now and just show the stream traces so the plot looks a little less busy. And uh, what I'm going to show next is some, uh, some options for calculating new variables in our data set. So the first option is using the data alter specify equations tool. And this brings up the specify equations dialog. And this allows me to uh, define new variables or redefine existing variables in my data set uh, using a custom function here. And I can modify zone by zone. I can control A to reselect all zones. If I want, I can specify the IJK range to make the calculation. I can change what the variable data type is output as. I can also specify what I want the variable location to be. Um, if I keep it as auto, it will uh, default to the variable location for the uh, variables uh, that are supplied to it in the data set. So rather than typing out the equation right now, I've got a equation file or EQN file already saved uh, just to save us a little bit of time so I don't need to type it all out. For reference for the syntax required for the specify equations tool, we can always click help in the bottom right, which takes us to the section in the TechPlot360 user's manual uh, for the dialog that we're looking at here, in this case, the specify equations dialog. And part of that will have um, a breakdown of the equation syntax, the different operations we can perform, et cetera, for uh, the equations tool. So in this case, I've got this load equation file. Velocity magnitude is the uh, equation I want to compute here. So I'll select open because I have these X, Y, Z velocity variables in my data set. But if I want a velocity magnitude displayed, I don't have that available right now. So I'm going to calculate a new variable for it. So if I open data set info just for reference to see uh, what we're using. I have my equation here and I actually have two lines for it, which are going to compute uh, the same thing. Uh, the top option, is referencing the full variable name, in this case, the X velocity, Y velocity, Z velocity. And the bottom option here is using a shorthand to reference the variable number, in this case, V5, V6, V7. We could also use UVW for shorthand since these are our assigned uh, vector variables as well. Um, so either option will work. Uh, if you want something quicker, I recommend using one of the shorthand options if you uh, uh, want to save a little bit of time. So in this case, I'll select compute. We'll get this notification, data alteration successful. And now we have this new variable in our data set, which is velocity magnitude. And if we step through here, we'll see the values for each of our zones. And if we wanna see it displayed on our data set, what I can do is uh, I, without interrupting uh, the first contra group of pressure that we've assigned here, maybe I want to change which contra group is being used for our slice, for example. Let's change to this second contra group and instead of using X velocity, let's change it to our newly calculated velocity magnitude. Now we have two uh, contour legends shown here. Let me move one a little bit away from the other, and I'll adjust this in a moment. And instead of using uh, our default color map, let's say we want to use a uh, sequential 
and we'll use the sequential purple color map for velocity magnitude. And now as we animate through time, we'll see our new variable velocity magnitude change uh, for the fluid volume while keeping that same pressure contour uh, display for the wing surface. Now to make some quick adjustments to the uh, contour legends here, what I'll do is I can double click the legend to bring up the uh, legend tab for the contour that we're looking at here. Let's change to horizontal and let's do the same for pressure. So we're not, uh, not looking at too much at a time. Actually, let's move this just below. There we go. There we go. So a quick uh, data alteration to make a new variable and uh, quick changes to our plot to visualize it. So that's option one. Another option for calculating new variable is using the CFD Analyze tool set. So for that, what I'll do is click the Analyze drop-down menu. And if I go to Calculate Variables and choose Select, this is a, less, a list of predefined uh, functions for commonly uh, needed variables in CFD analysis. So we can actually see we have velocity magnitude as part of the calculation here if we wanted to use that. But instead of doing that again, let's calculate a new variable, which is vorticity magnitude. So I'll select OK, and if I click Calculate, I'll actually be presented with this error message indicating that um, we have not provided proper uh, field variables for the uh, CFD Analyze tool. And so for that, what I need to do is go to Analyze, Field Variables, um, so that we can specify which uh, convective variables and which state variables we need to use for the calculation. So if I click Select, I'm going to use my XYZ velocity variables, simple enough. And I know I have pressure and density in my data set, so I'm going to click Select here, change to Pressure and Density. Choose those, make sure those are defined. And now when I click Calculate again, we'll get this notification saying Calculate On Demand was successfully set up. And that's what this toggle right here is. So Calculate On Demand means the, uh, the calculation has been uh, prepared, but the data for this new variable is not loaded until some specific plot element demands it. And so what that means, if I click close and open up data set info, we have this new vorticity magnitude variable, uh, but we'll see it's not loaded uh, for any of our zones. And that's because we don't have any plot element referencing it. So this is to save a bit of time on computation um, and in your work to uh, have the variables be created without too much additional load time initially, um, so that you're only loading until you actually need it in your plot. So let's do that. Let's change our, uh, Let's change this velocity magnitude to the newly calculated vorticity. So what I can do is double click the legend again to bring up the, uh, the contour group for velocity magnitude. And let's just change to vorticity magnitude. The data will be loaded and we'll see the, uh, the contour does update, uh, but what happens is the, uh, the contour levels that uh, have been pre-selected for tech plot aren't, uh, aren't that great for um, what we want to look at in this region of our data set. So what we can do is click set levels and let's change uh, from a standard dis distribution to an exponential distribution. Let's add a couple more contour levels. When we select OK, it'll improve it a little bit, but maybe we want to add a couple more levels. Let's use this add contour level tool to add more levels near the region of interest for our data set. There we go. And now as I keep adding levels, our contour legend gets wider and wider. So what I can do is go to legend and click resize automatically. And maybe I want to do the same for our uh, first contour group as well, so that they're taking up less space in our plot. And now as I step through time and show the time animation again, we'll see this new vorticity magnitude uh, variable shown along the slice. All right, and those are two options for calculating new variables in our data set. Next, what I'm going to show is how to do some data extraction, and in this case, do some data extraction over time uh, because we have an unsteady simulation. So what I can do is we have this uh, probe to create time series plot tool underneath the tools drop down menu. If I click this, my cursor changes to a crosshair. And if I left click, what happens is TechBot will actually create a new data set from, uh, from that uh, specific point that we probed, and it will show the values of, in this case, the initial contour variable, the pressure, over time for our simulation. So if I click play again, 
we'll see the simulation play in 3D, but in this newly created frame here, we'll also see the pressure value uh, change over time at that point. Now what I can do is if I click this frame, our plot sidebar updates indicating the new plot type we're using, which is the XY line plot type. And this is a little bit different than the 3D Cartesian plot type that we were looking at initially. And uh, what I can do is I can still use a right click tool uh, here to adjust uh, adjust the, the line type, curve type, if I wanted for the line plot that we're looking at here. Maybe I want to change the line color, something that stands out a little bit more. And I can also go to the mapping style dialog, which is uh, similar in appearance to the zone style dialog, but is a little bit different because these are mappings that can be created or deleted uh, that reference the variables uh, for the zones in our data set. So let's say I also want to see uh, velocity magnitude, vorticity magnitude, and I don't really have any good values for uh, these remaining variables here. So what I can do is I can uh, click and select delete map for these ones, delete map for X, Y, Z. So we're just looking at our pressure, velocity, and vorticity magnitudes. And if I do a control F to view fit, we can see those a little bit better. Um, but one of them in particular, in this case, the vorticity magnitude, we don't see too much change for that. So what we, what we might want to do is change the axis that is plotted for our magnitude variables. Let's change those to Y2, and let's do another view fit so we can see those a little bit better. Now I can also make adjustments to, uh, let's make these stand out a little bit better. Maybe I want this to be a, uh, uh, yeah, different line color for that. I can change the line thickness if I want to make them stand out a little bit better, especially when we're exporting. Uh, to make it even better, I can change the line pattern to make it clear which one we're looking at. And then uh, to give us a better idea of what each line type represents, we can go to plot line legend and toggle along the line legend here uh, to uh, make it even more clear what the data is that we're looking at. Now I referenced the adjuster tool at the very beginning of the demonstration, which allows me to uh, fine tune specific parts of the plot. If I want to move the... Uh, the axis label off a little bit. If I want to move the axis altogether, I could do that. So I can make uh, some more fine tuning using the adjuster tool that the selector tool doesn't really allow us to do. All right, so that's uh, that can be quite a few steps to create the exact uh, line plot type that we want. And especially if we're reusing a different data extractions, rather than going through all those steps, what we can use is uh, something called style sheets. So if I go to frame, load frame style, I've already got one defined here, which will look uh, somewhat similar uh, to the plot type that I have set up here. But if I collect open on this STY file, what this will do is it'll update our plot. It actually updates the time step for the 3D plot as well, which is why we don't see any of those plot elements appear here. Uh, but that allows you to uh, reuse the same plot style uh, for similar uh, data sets uh, so that you don't have to click through and go through all those same exact steps. So now if we click play here, we'll see that 3D animation appear showing the pressure, velocity, magnitude, and vorticity magnitude for that uh, probe location that we used. And now the, the frame is obscuring the contour legends for our 3D view. So let's go to frame tile frames and place one on top of the other um, and maybe adjust this view a little bit uh, so we can see more clearly uh, the entire data set. Now, if we're happy with the way our uh, layout looks right now, what we can do is save our work by going uh, to File, Save Layout As, and this will open up the Save Layout dialog. Um, and what this will save is um, everything that's on the current workspace here, all of the frames. And then if we have any additional pages um, uh, in our uh, session of TechPlot 360. So the style sheet that I used earlier, specific to frames, um, we're saving a layout, we'll save all of the work that we've uh, done in our current instance of TechPlot 360. So now that we have the save layout dialog open here, we have two options for saving a layout. The first is a linked data or .lay layout, and this saves a separate layout file with all, uh, uh, all the plot information for our workspace, and it'll point to the data set or data sets that were used in uh, this session of TechPlot 360. The other option is a package data or LPK layout, and this saves uh, all as one file, the layout information, and it'll resave the data set information in TechPlot binary, all in one packaged uh, or LPK file, uh, which can be better for, uh, or it's easier to save 
and uh, share your work, uh, but it'll take up a little more space because it will resave the data set. So depending on your preference and your workflow, um, either option uh, is open to you. Now, if we want to uh, just show off our work, what we can do is go to File, Export, to bring open the Export dialog. And what this allows me to do is export in multiple different uh, vector and raster image uh, export options. I can specify which uh, region I want to export as. In this case, we've defaulted to all frames. If I want to export just frame by frame, I could do that as well. And then we can um, specify how detailed we want our export to be, anti-aliasing for a more crisp and clean looking plot. Uh, toggle it off if you want a quicker image export uh, for, more, uh, for a, a lot of images at a time. Now the other export option, um, that's available to us for uh, this unsteady simulation. If we open up this gear icon to open up the time animation details dialog, there's this film strip icon that'll open up the animation export for this specific animation type. So we can choose multiple different video formats or we can export as a sequence of images. And then the same options that we had in the image export for adjusting uh, the actual export we want to use. And for reference on which animation options are available to us in our data set, we can go to the Animate drop-down menu. We can see animation options for our isosurfaces, slices, and stream traces, so our derived objects. Time animation, which is uh, possible for this transient data set. And we also have this keyframe animation, uh, which is uh, available to us uh, for 3D Cartesian, which allows me to append multiple different 3D views. And we can uh, show off a cool uh, 3D perspective change animation for our data set. Now notice as I'm animating, we actually have this orange bounding box, which indicates the boundary of our fluid volume. If you want to turn that off, go to options, toggle off show bounding boxes to remove that. So one other uh, export option uh, that we can use uh, for images or specific frames, we can uh, copy using right click or control C, the specific frame, and we can just control C and control V to a Word document or PowerPoint presentation if we just wanna make a quick, uh, quick copy of the plot that we're looking at to our presentation. All right, and that concludes the uh, uh, content I wanted to show in TechPlot 360 for our demonstration today. So what I'll do is uh, take a look at some of the uh, questions that have come up during the demonstration. Um, a reminder again, if you do have questions following this, be sure to email us at support at techplot.com or support-eu uh, at techplot.com if you're in Europe, um, if you have any questions related to your work in TechPlot 360. So we had a couple that came in prior uh, to uh, the webinar. So I'll take a look at those. And then my colleague Devin will help me with uh, some of the questions that have come up during uh, the demonstration as well. So one of the questions that came in is, what does all active zones are volume zones? Do you want to turn on surfaces for active zones mean? What actions should I take? And so what this, uh, to show what this actually is in TechBot 360, uh, if we toggle on, uh, or if we show, if we go to surfaces, we have this uh, fluid volume zone. And when you uh, toggle on uh, shade, when you just have volume zones, you'll get this notification saying all active zones are volume zones. Do you want to turn on surface for active zones? Um, and what this does, it'll show the boundary of the, or the surface of those volume zones. In this case, not very helpful for our data set. So if you ever want to modify this and uh, change that, you can go to the surfaces tab in the zone style dialog and right click and change that back to none so that, uh, you're not seeing the boundary of the volume zones, you're just going to see, uh, uh, the, see the interior of, of the volume zones using the derived objects, for example, like we've shown here. So that was uh, one of the first questions that came in. Another one uh, that came in was, what is the difference between TechPlot 360 and TechPlot Focus? Uh, so this uh, software that I showed today is TechPlot 360, which is our flagship software, um, which has, uh, all of the capabilities that TechPlot Focus has, uh, and uh, and then some. So TechPlot Focus is a lighter version of TechPlot 360. It can do a lot of, uh, quite a few of the plotting capabilities that I showed today, like the zone layers, uh, the plot sidebar, it can load in TechPlot data, um, but it lacks a couple things that TechPlot 360 has. So Focus has fewer data loaders than TechPlot 360. Um, it has uh, no CFD analyze tools so that CFD analyze tool set for calculating variables is not available to you. There's no Python automation 
it can use the macro language, but it doesn't use the Python API. And there's also a 5 million data point limit. So if you're working with large data, and if you want to do specific uh, CFD analysis, TechPlot360 is the preferred tool for you. And just for reference, uh, I have a uh, quick handout here showing uh, a side-by-side -side comparison of the things TechPlot Focus can do compared to TechPlot360. And if I scroll down here, you can see all the different data loaders that you will lose access to uh, with TechPlot360 compared, or sorry, with TechPlot Focus compared to TechPlot360. So if you're using any of these data format types, TechPlot360 definitely preferred. All right. Let's see if there have been any uh, other questions that have come in uh, since uh, the demonstration started. Devin, are there any uh, any good ones uh, that are worth answering yeah. right now? So um, the first question I'm going to uh, throw to you is, uh, how do you display a unit uh, alongside um, your legend display? Ah, good question. So TechPot360 is what uh, some would call units agnostic. And so uh, what we're just looking at here is the values um, uh, that are saved for the specific variable. So if we want to display a unit, we can go to data, data set info, and we could type in next to the uh, next to the variable name, what unit it ought to represent. Yeah. And so uh, that should up update the variable name in the legend once it's displayed because it's displaying Correct. pressure as the um, thing. Correct. So yeah. yeah, and if I if I do the same for let's change to once we change back to velocity magnitude, let me add a couple more uh, options for the legend box. We'll see rather than just showing velocity magnitude, we actually have the units for the variable uh, displayed there. Yeah, so so the so okay, some more questions. Um, there's a question about uh, loading uh, fluent data, and the geometry appears uh, distorted. Uh, and my guess is that uh, the quick answer to that is that uh, TechPlot has a default aspect ratio. So sometimes uh, you have to go into plot axes. Uh, and it will set the dependency and the size factors to be different uh, if you're not, um, if you've got one dimension that's highly uh, distorted. Uh, so have a look at that property uh, that Jared's showing right now. Um, can you explain the difference between limit animation speed toggle in the animation window and the actual frame rate specified within the exporting the anima animation? Uh, so the difference there is what's, uh, so the limit animation speed is for what's displayed on screen. And animation speed in the export dialog is um, specific to the, or is a actual animation speed that's defined in the exported file. The limit animation speed is only f used for on sp on screen animation. Um, yeah, good question. Can we add equations to the axis if needed? Um, so there's a, we can use the uh, text tool and we can uh, define uh, equations through here and place those near the axis. And we could also use uh, LaTeX equations if we have those installed on our machine. In this case, I do not have it installed on my machine. Uh, but using the text details uh, tool, we can define um, uh, unique characters and we can define equations uh, that will line up with the, uh, the axis if we want to use that. Yeah, and so this is also the same person who is asking about the um, the uh, axis distortion. So I'm wondering if you might want to also do a data alter to the variable that you're displaying on the axis before plotting. So you could uh, 
alter your data like Jared showed earlier. Uh, we don't have an axis specific uh, change. So I think that's probably what you're looking for. Um, and then we've got a question. How do you um, partition an isosurface? OK. You, uh, I can take that, Jared, if you sure. want. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so there's a couple ways to do it, uh, as he's showing real quick. Um, the first would be uh, to use value blanking if it's uh, restricted to different regions. Uh, if you know the, if you're looking for isosurface in certain areas. Uh, and we didn't show value blinking in this demonstration, but it allows you to uh, hide regions of data um, depending on different variables. And so uh, you can use value blinking and then the data extract or extract the isosurface and then do data extract blank zone to subset it. Uh, and there's another one that allows you to do it by connected regions but if you need more details uh free feel free to uh send support a question on that um we're getting lots of questions here so we might not be able to grab any more or too many more that's right we'll answer what we can and if there's uh if there's ones where we uh if you have specific questions about a workflow that you want to accomplish, yeah, contact support and there's a, we, we can help you with your um, specific question or workflow that you're working on. Um, can you say something about the cutoff value of co contour plots? Yeah, uh, so if I open up the contour details, color cutoff allows us to, uh, here, let me, Let's use it for a velocity magnitude since that's the more visible one. This will um, not plot uh, above or below certain values. So let me, let's plot, let's say below 10, something like that. Oh, I'm gonna need even higher, let's do 20. Too high, <laughs> okay, <laughs> there we go. This will not, uh, not plot uh, the contour levels um, above or below the, the values defined here. So if I wanna limit to a specific range in the, in the uh, view that I'm looking at, this allows me to, to do that. So let's say maybe above 23, something like that. No, there we go. Yeah, okay. so it can create, if you do it the opposite way, you can create kind of cool accordions of uh, contours right around, or slices on contours right around an object. Um, like the, I think Jared had an image in the slides Yep. Let's see. Uh, we got that one. Could you please show some possibilities of using stream traces? I found settings in stream traces where I want them to fall want them in the flow or found setting the stream traces where i want them in the flow rather volume rather difficult at times sure yeah so i didn't get into uh too many of the other options for how to see the stream traces the first one i showed is using the stream trace placement tool Oops, try this again there we go um what we can also do is we can see them on uh the objects I've selected. So if I click the slice, I could see them along that. I could see them on all active objects. And I can also specify the exact X, Y, Z position that I want the stream trace at a single position to be, or if I want a rake of stream traces, the start and end point uh, for the rake. So if you want a little more precision uh, in how you're placing the stream traces, I recommend using the X, Y, Z position tool. The stream trace placement tool is more, uh, more as a good uh, qualitative, uh, uh, qualitative placement on your plot as you're looking at it in the frame.
Uh, so I think that's most, or so there's a question about uh, font sizing to um, match what you're required in to for journal, um, or for journal exports. Um, so Jared, do you want to take that one? Uh, let me see. Yeah, what's this one? Uh, or I can grab it if you. Let, let me, yeah, let's take a look. So if the, uh, I think it should be, in, I think they're referring to the paper setup or hold on. So I think there's a few different ways to do this. Um, we have our font sizings either relative to the frame height or you can uh, set a specific frame size with the paper setup. We do have kind of the concept of a print uh, size and specify the size of the frame specifically as well as point size fonts. So we have a lot of control over how the fonts displayed um, in the UI. Uh, by default, it's sized by font height or frame height uh, so that they scale, but you can change it to uh, a standard point export. And the last question, I think that Jared, for one for you, is there a free uh, plan for students? Um, we, we offer a couple uh, different licensing options for academic users. Um, if you have uh, questions or you're curious about what uh, what options are available, email campus at techplot.com and we can explain the different license options available to a, to you as a student. And we were pretty flexible about, flexible about uh, letting uh, students uh, evaluate and try for free uh, for a portion of time, TechPlot 360 uh, to use with their work. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks for your time and have a great day.